So we continue now with the study of the Majimani Kaya. And last time we met, we completed Sutta number two, the Sabhasava Sutta. And now we'll take Sutta number six. This is called the Akankaya Sutta, which actually means if one should wish. And for those of you who read Chinese, there's a counterpart of this in the Zhong Lan Jing. It's number 105. Yi Bai Ling. Wait a minute. Okay, so the sutta begins again when the Buddha is living in Savati, in Jaitu's Grove. And then in this version, the Buddha begins by addressing the monks and emphasizing the need for the, or the importance of the observance of sila, which is here, here translated as virtue, but it actually means virtuous conduct. That is, conduct, conduct that is in accordance with the rules of discipline. And particularly emphasized here is the discipline of the patimokkha, which is the fundamental code of monastic rules. And so the sutta begins with the Buddha saying, addressing the monks, he says, bhikkhus dwell possessed of virtue, or possessed, it could also be translated, possessed of the precepts, or possessed of virtuous conduct, possessed of the patimokkha, Restrained with the restraint of the Patimokkha, perfect in conduct and resort, and seeing fear, or probably better danger, in the slightest fault, trained by undertaking the training precepts. And so here the key word that's being emphasized is Patimokkha. And that, as I said, it's the basic code of monastic rules that the Buddha has laid down for both monks and nuns. There are two closely correlated collections of rules, one laid down for monks or bhikkhus, the other laid down for bhikkhunis, the fully ordained Buddhist nuns. And so here the text is first emphasizing the importance of dwelling restrained by the Patimokkha, because this is a code of restraint that lays down rules that are intended to restrain types of conduct which are often expressions of defilements, but many of them are also types of conduct which went against the customs of the Indian ascetic communities of the period, they're not very much directly concerned with morality as such, but more with the kind of conduct expected from an ascetic. For example, a bhikkhu, a monk, is not allowed to pluck flowers or to pluck fruits or to cut um, leaves or branches from a tree. And this is not because the Buddha himself believed that plant life has consciousness. Of course, according to the Buddha, there's no break of the first precept by a lay person or by a novice monk if they pluck flowers, pluck fruits, or cut down 
trees or plant life. But in the Buddha's time, there was a widespread belief that plant, amongst the common people, that plants have some kind of life faculty. And so when they found that Buddhist monks were sometimes cutting down trees, or breaking branches off, off trees or plants, people complained to the Buddha. And so out of compliance with the prevailing norms of the period, the Buddha laid down this rule for the monastic order. Okay, so the first paragraph of the sutta emphasizes the importance of first observing the restraint of the patimokkha, then being perfect in conduct and resort. Actually, the word that's translated perfect here, maybe it's a little too strong, but it could also be translated as accomplished in conduct and resort. That means that one's conduct, behavior should be appropriate, suitable for a renunciant person, and one should, what's meant by resort here is generally the place where one goes on alms round. That one should go on alms round to suitable places, not staying too long at those places. We came across some of those principles in the Sabhasava Sutta that we studied last time. And then seeing fear or danger in the slightest fault indicates the way sometimes what seem to be slight breaches of the discipline, if left uncontrolled and unchecked, can sort of gradually take root in the mind and then send out branches until one becomes involved in major violations of the precepts. And so one has to be quite diligent and conscientious in observing the training rules or precepts. Okay, so the sutta begins by emphasizing the importance of sila or virtue, because in the Buddha's training, we proceed through three stages of training or discipline. Probably all of you are familiar with the scheme, but I'll put it on the board anyway. Seems I'm restrained not only by the restraint of the Pati <laughs> but by the restraint of this microphone. <laughs> like a dog that goes every place with its muscle, I have to go around with it. Okay, so the Buddhist training is divided into these three primary stages. The training in sila, which is moral discipline, virtuous behavior. Then the training in samadhi, which is usually translated as concentration, that is collecting the mind, learning to focus the mind, to unify the mind. Then this is accomplished through the training in what is called samatha, which means the stilling or quieting of the mind. And then the third stage of training is the training in panya, which is wisdom. And then that is accomplished through the practice of vipassana or insight meditation. 
And so in the refrain, which is going to be re repeated in each of the paragraphs of the sutta, you'll find that the entire threefold training is referred to. And so, if we go to paragraph three, we'll just put aside the opening sentence, which expresses the wish, but we can see the threefold training being indicated as the method to achieve each of these aims or wishes that a monk or any practitioner might have. So first, let him fulfill the precepts that indicates sila, the training in virtuous behavior. Let him be devoted to internal serenity of mind. The word that's translated as serenity here is samatha. So that is the practice of stilling, quieting the mind in order to achieve samadhi, deep meditative absorption. And then the text says, let him not neglect meditation. And the word that's translated meditation here is the Pali word jhana. stages in which the mind becomes completely unified, focused, and absorbed in its object. But also it seems to me that sometimes in the text the word jhana is used not in that more specific and technical sense, but rather in a more general sense as meaning the process of meditation, the activity of meditation. So it's the activity of meditation that, when fulfilled, brings the attainment of the jhanas, the meditative absorptions. And so we can see both devotion to internal serenity of mind and not neglecting meditation to be two expressions that come under the heading of samadhi, two aspects in, or two prerequisites in developing samadhi concentration. And then the text says, let him be possessed of insight. And here the Pali word is vipassana. And so that is indicating the training in wisdom. And then interestingly, the text or the passage ends by saying, let him dwell in empty huts. But actually the Pali word, the verb here, I think it's bruheti. It's a little difficult to translate exactly. It means something like to Maybe to frequent empty huts might be better, <laughs> except that now we don't often use frequent as a verb in English. It seems a little bit archaic. But it has the sense, not simply of dwelling in them, but of often, maybe we could say frequently dwelling in empty huts. And an empty hut is indicated as a suitable place for practicing meditation whether it be serenity, the samatha, or vipassana insight. So generally in South and Southeast Asia, in the monastery, there'll be a number of what are called kutis. These are little huts which might just be equipped with a bed, a simple table, a chair. More modern ones will have an attached toilet 
and some of them will have even an attached walkway with a canopy above it. So when it's raining or during the middle of the day when the sun is hot, the monk can do the walking meditation without having to worry about either being drenched by rain or sweltering because of the hot sun. The less, um, shall I say, luxurious meditation booties don't have the sheltered canopy, but the walkway is out. It could be under trees, and so the trees will provide shelter from the hot sun, but <laughs> they're not so effective in providing shelter when it's during the monsoon season when the rain comes pouring down and one has to stay in indoors. Okay, so now this is the repetitive passage that will come at the end of every one of the paragraphs of the sutta. And so based on this framework, of sila samadhi panya, moral virtuous behavior, concentration, wisdom, the Buddha is going to show how a monk or any aspirant can fulfill any of his virtuous wishes. And we see here that there'll be, as the Buddha often indicates, a gradual deepening of the types or a gradual deepening or a gradual elevation of the types of things for which one might wish. Okay, so the first is, if the monk should wish, may I be dear and agreeable to my companions in the holy life, the brahmacharya, the spiritual life, respected and esteemed by them, let them fulfill the three stages of the training indicated here by precepts, serenity, jhana, insight, and frequenting empty huts. So the first, this is a somewhat worldly wish, though of course it's a natural wish which is can be wholesome if it steers one in a wholesome direction. Since when one is living together with other monks, nuns, or practitioners in a monastery or meditation center, one wants to have friendly relations with them based upon mutual appreciation and mutual respect. And so, being dedicated to the threefold training that is the way to inspire both the affection and respect and esteem of others. <clears throat> so the Buddha begins with this, probably in order to show how the observance of the threefold training is necessary as a basis, a foundation for establishing harmony and cooperation and mutual appreciation, mutual admiration amongst his ordained disciples. Sometimes the text contrasts two ways in which the Sangha might be dwelling. The undesirable way, it said, is that the monks are engaged in argu arguments, quarrels and disputes, wounding each other with the knives of their mouths. <laughs> so they use the tongue like a knife or like a sword, speaking angrily and bitterly to others, putting them down, quarreling, disputing. Sometimes it could be over very trivial little points. And then in contrast we have the harmonious Sangha. And in this Sangha it said that the monks are dwelling, blending like milk and water. Like when you take milk, or if you take water, pour it into milk, the water just mixes with the milk. And so you can't distinguish what is milk, what is water. So it said that the monks are dwelling together, harmonious,
kiss with mutual appreciation, blending like milk and water. Okay, so this is the first wish that can be fulfilled through the threefold training. Then we come to the second. Again, this is a little bit worldly. <laughs> May I be one to, <laughs> to obtain robes, arms, food, resting place, and medicinal requisites. If he has that kind of wish, let him fulfill the precepts. I'm laughing because yesterday, just as I was settling down to my <laughs> afternoon nap, the telephone started to ring, and it was a friend of mine, another monk living in the U.S., <laughs> in Tennessee. <laughs> He said he has a problem. <laughs> some of his supporters asked him if he needs new robes. He said, I need some new robes. Uh, if he needs new robes, he said, yes, I need some new robes. <laughs> but please don't get me bright orange robes. <laughs> <laughs> so he called and he told me, The supporters brought me the package of robes. <laughs> I opened it, looked inside, <laughs> and they're bright orange. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> and I said, well, why don't we meet in the middle of an atom <laughs> and discuss the matter? But to me, you have to be wearing your bright orange. <laughs> then I was thinking to call him and <laughs> say, Hello, this is National Fire Department. <laughs> Would often arise in the monastic order. 
to obtain new robes or to obtain a suitable dwelling place. Okay, so this is the kind of wish that a monk could have, and this is, we call this a self-directed wish. The next two are still somewhat mundane wishes, but they have an altruistic dimension. Okay, so in paragraph five, if the monk should wish, may the services of those whose robes, alms, food, resting place, and medicinal requisites that I use bring them great fruit and benefit, let them fulfill the precepts. Okay, so in this case, because of this principle of merit, in order for the practitioner to become a proper field of merit, who will enable the people who make the offerings to acquire the wholesome karma, or to acquire abundant wholesome karma through making the offerings, then he should fulfill the principles of the threefold, he should fulfill the threefold training. Then when people make the offerings, because the monk becomes a more fertile field of merit, then those offerings will rebound, rebound to their welfare and happiness for a long time. Then paragraph 6 continues this altruistic note or, or theme. If the monk should wish, when my kinsmen and relatives who have passed away remember me with confidence in their minds, may that bring them great fruit and benefit. Okay, this might say, seem a little bit strange to a Westerner who's not familiar with these principles of Buddhist thought. The underlying principle here is that when our relatives pass away, according to Buddhism, they don't just vanish into nothingness, but many of them will continue to exist on certain qualities other vibrational frequencies and other subtle realms of existence. It could be in the deva realms, the realms of the gods, in the realm of the pratas or ghostly realms. And in these realms, the relatives are able to witness what we are doing. They're able to see our actions, even though we might not be able to see them. And in some of these realms, the relatives are not able to do any wholesome karma, to originate any wholesome karma on their own. But they are dependent on the wholesome behavior of their living relatives in order to advance spiritually. So the way this works, sometimes we use the phrase in the popular literature, what is the phrase, transference of merit. But the merit is not actually transferred from, say, from myself to my departed relatives. But rather, what one does, <clears throat> one performs some wholesome deeds, virtuous deeds, <clears throat> and one makes the wish in one's mind, may this merit be shared by my departed relatives. May they witness my good deeds, and may they rejoice in these deeds, and may, by rejoicing, may they partake in the merit of my deeds. And so by making this mental determination or mental wish for the relatives to know the good deeds that we're doing, they're able to rejoice, at least some of them, those who are in these subtle realms, and rejoice in the good deeds. In their own hearts, they feel glad and happy that their living human relative is doing good deeds and thinking of them <clears throat> with a heart of loving kindness and wishing for their welfare. And then when they're aware of this, they rejoice, and their rejoicing becomes for them a source of merit. 
So that's how they are able to obtain meritorious karma. And so it's a tradition in the Buddhist countries, say if somebody's relative has passed away, then they will often they go to the monastery, they'll invite a group of monks to come to their house, and it could be often in Sri Lanka it would be three days after the death, seven days, one month, and then after that three months, and then after that the annual memorial day each year. So they invite the monks to come to their house. They make an offering of food and other requisites like robes, um, the little deli, things that one uses every day like toothpaste, toothbrush, soap, a towel, some simple medicines, non-prescription medicines. Sometimes if one needs, has something special that one needs, they could offer bed sheets, pillows, pillowcases, whatever. Then after that, sort of guided by the monks, they do a little ceremony of, it's sort of symbolized by taking water, what has water in a pitcher, a bowl, and the bowl is placed on a plate, and then they pour the water from the pitcher into the bowl till it fills up the bowl and overflows the bowl flowing out into the plate. And this symbolizes, and while they're doing this, they're reciting some verses. <coughs> may this merit go to my relatives, may my relatives be happy. And then the water overflowing the bowl into the plate symbolizes the merit overflowing from the people who have made the offerings flowing over to their relatives who have passed away and are now living in some other realm of existence. So whenever we do meritorious deeds, even at the end of the day, especially if you do meditation sitting, at the end of the sitting, then you could just think, just for a few moments, of departed relatives, either specifically, like if it's departed father, mother, brother, sister, or generally, may any of my departed relatives or friends rejoice in this merit and receive all benefits. And it's quite possible that there are departed relatives, that you have departed relatives who will witness this rejoice, and that will help them in their new life and their transition back to the human realm. Okay, so that is what is being indicated here in this passage, number six, because when one observes the precepts, practices, meditation, develops insight, then one acquires the merit and one offers that merit or one invites the departed relatives to rejoice in that merit to think of one with trust, with confidence, with joy, and then that will bring them great benefits. Okay, then the Buddha says, the monk might wish, may I become a conqueror of discontent and delight. Here, discontent means becoming upset, becoming dissatisfied, for example, becoming dissatisfied with having to live maybe in the forest, just in a simple hut, having to go on arms round every day, um, missing out on the pleasures, and the worldly pleasures and enjoyments. So that is discontent. And often when that arises, if it becomes very strong, then it will lead the monastic person to disrobe and return to the worldly life. Then the opposite of this is what's called delight, but this is not the spiritual delight, but this is the tendency of the mind to be seeking delight in what you might call worldly enjoyments. So maybe say, since in the monk's life there's not much entertainment, <laughs> so the monk might be thinking of what kind of food he's going to get with the meal offering that day or the next day, 
or if he gets thinking, how can I get beautiful robes? How can I get a nice, <laughs> instead of having this little bamboo hut down in the forest, how can I get a nice solid cottage with four or five rooms? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so to become the conqueror of discontent and delight, one has to follow this threefold training. When one follows the training diligently, then one begins to experience an inner happiness, an inner joy, which stays with one, it becomes a kind of footing, like an island that gives one a foothold and that will support one amongst the temp tempestuous currents of worldly desire. And so one doesn't become discontent, thinking that one is missing out on the enjoyments of the worldly life, because now one has this inner pleasure, this inner happiness, which swells up from the mind itself. And because one has access to that inner happiness, the mind doesn't dwell upon the prospect of indulging in worldly delights. And so in this way one conquers discontent and delight. <clears throat> okay, see now we'll be moving away from somewhat mundane desires to more spiritual desires. So first to conquer discontent and delight, then comes the wish May I become a conqueror of fear and dread, and may fear and dread not conquer me. This is something that can arise in a monk who's living out in the forest. Because when one is living in the forest, it could be far away from others. Even if one is living in a monastery with huts spread out in the forest, one can have fear of wild animals. I guess in India in the Buddhist time there was still the forests were quite thick, so there would be animals like tigers, leopards, bears, hyenas. And then the mind can project all kinds of wild ideas. So sometimes if the wind is blowing, and then the branches are rustling against one another. One gets the fear, the tiger is coming to get me. <laughs> the leopard has come. And then in ancient India, in the Buddhist time, and even in Asia today, there's a widespread belief in ghosts. <laughs> and I mean, I've known mature, highly educated <laughs> monks in Sri Lanka who <laughs> still believe in ghosts, even Westerners. And <laughs> so when you're living alone or in a very quiet place at, at night, and then there's this, again, the wind blowing, rustling of leaves, spring sounds, the candle goes out, you have no matches. Then comes the fear of the ghosts or the zombies are going to come, catch me and eat me. And then of course, <laughs> the monks will be familiar with the stories from the Pali commentaries, which talk about how these, we call them yakshas, these terrible, ferocious monsters come and they eat up <laughs> monks living alone in the forest. <laughs> One starts thinking, uh-oh, I'm going to be the subject of the next story. <laughs> they'll come and they'll find me with my head eaten off, just the body, with everything from the neck down remaining, but the head is gone, or the body is torn open, and the internal organs are all gone, and so one becomes very afraid. Okay, so to conquer this fear, then, when one has strong meditation, then even though one might hear animals coming, even though there might really be animals out there, 
But because one has the strong power of samadhi, one doesn't let fear arise in the mind, but one can keep the mind calm and equanimous under those conditions. And sometimes it's said that those monks who have strong power of samadhi, particularly if they have developed strong metta and karuna, loving kindness and compassion, they can dwell even amidst the wild animals, and the wild animals have just no thoughts of harming them, of injuring them. Like I know there was one monk, an elderly German monk who was living in Sri Lanka. He was living in a cave, <coughs> or he was, came to stay in a cave. Then when he was in that cave, maybe a couple of days after he took up his residence there, a bear came into the cave, and the bear saw this monk living in the cave and thought, what is he doing taking over my house? <laughs> and so the bear came after him, and this monk was very good in meditation, especially in metta meditation. And so what he did was to put his mind into the frame of the metta meditation, and then he started to recite the metta sutta the Buddha's discourse on loving-kindness. Then the bear, as the monk was chanting, stopped his forward movement, turned around, and walked out. <laughs> but I think the monk changed his residence after that, he didn't stay in the cave. <laughs> okay, so, when one fulfills this threefold training, then one is able to overcome this fear and dread. Okay, next comes the wish, may I become one to obtain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now. So to attain the jhanas, he has to fulfill, it's said, the threefold training. Though actually, to obtain the jhanas, one doesn't actually need the training in vipassana itself. Since just the training in samadhi, or in samatha, is able to lead to the jhanas. But I think in order to keep the whole training intact, it's repeated with regard to each of these benefits. Okay, a, when we come to a later sutta, we'll go into the four jhanas themselves, but here we just take them as a group. Okay, so next comes a wish to reach the higher meditative stages beyond the jhanas. So if the monk should wish, may I contact with the body and abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial or formless, transcending forms, let him fulfill this threefold training. And this passage is referring to the, what are called the four formless meditative attainments. In Pali, these are called the Arupa Samapatti. Okay, so the four jhanas are sometimes called the four rupa samapati, that means the four attainments with form, because they're based on some kind of, usually it's a visible form as the object, some kind of bright light, bright image. 
But beyond the four jhanas, there are four other med <coughs> meditative attainments which do not have any form as their object. <coughs> These are refinements in the development of samadhi. You've come across these, I'm sure those who have read suttas extensively, you've come across these several times. They're called the base of the infinity of space, the base of the infinity of consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. We will encounter them again and then I'll explain them when we come to them. But here it's sufficient just to know that the attainment of these states, these formless liberations, depends especially on fulfilling, observing the precepts and fulfilling the training in samadhi. And when they're called liberations, this has to be taken in a qualified sense. They're not liberations in the sense that they, by themselves, bring liberation from samsara from birth and death, but rather they're called liberations because they liberate the mind temporarily from its connection to material form. And if one masters these formless meditations without developing wisdom, they will lead one to rebirth in the formless realms. There are realms of existence which correspond to the formless meditations. And so one who masters the formless meditations without developing insight or wisdom will tend to rebirth in the formless realms, which are very peaceful, very long-lasting, but from the Buddhist point of view, they are not in any way the ultimate goal. Okay, now starting with the next passage, the Buddha is going to show the stages of, we call these the stages of awakening, the stages of realization that can be achieved th through the threefold training. In the last chapter, when we discussed the last chapter of the Buddha's words in my earlier course, we went through the four stages of realization. So here we can just take them concisely, not in detail. So the first stage is accomplished through the destruction of the three lower fetters. Actually, we met these already in the Savasava Sutta which we took last, two, a few weeks ago. These are the three fetters of what's called identity view, or the view of a self existing in relation to the five aggregates. Doubt, that is doubt about the Buddha and his teaching. And then Sila Bhatta Paramasa, the wrong grasp of rules and observances that's blindly adhering to certain rules and observances with the idea that this is sufficient to attain liberation. And so with the achievement of the first stage of awakening, one penetrates the ultimate truth of the Dhamma, one sees the Four Noble Truths, and one cuts off those three fetters so that one enters the stream of the Dhamma and one becomes what's called the Sotapanna, a stream enterer who's no longer subject to perdition. People don't use this word very often anymore. Maybe we would say he's no longer subject to rebirth in the lower realms. The stream enterer can no longer be reborn in the three lower realms, the hells, the animal realm, or the realm of the pratas, the tormented spirits. He's bound for liberation and heading for the full enlightenment. 
And then other texts say that this kind of disciple has no more than seven rebirths, either in the human realm or in the celestial realms, and then will make an end of dukkha, of birth and death. Okay, next, we now move on to the next, second stage of awakening. This is the stage of the once return. And so, the once returner, like the stream enterer, has eradicated the first three fetters and has further weakened lust, hatred, and delusion. And so by weakening, further weakening lust, hatred, and delusion, this disciple, it said, returns once more to this world and then reaches the end of suffering. But if you remember the way I explained it in the last course, based on what the Abhidharma commentaries say, even though the Sutta says he returns once more to this world, there's like a little footnote to that. 